Okay, let's take our Bibles and go back to Colossians chapter number 1. This is where we were last Wednesday, Colossians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, let me just remind you, though I know you know it, that some of the things we have to do through this time of phase 1 and, and, and um, trying to behave ourselves wisely, uh, we have to do because there are nefarious souls that if they had the opportunity would sue our church or any kind of other crazy thing. Um, and um, we wouldn't put it past somebody who's against the church come in here sick. I mean, that's just how the devil works. So when we communicate to you these different things, there's a reason behind it. And um, uh, we want to be careful and be cautious, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Amen. Now that's a good Bible word, a Bible a word for it. Colossians chapter number 1 and um, down in here into verse number 9. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 9. And we were talking about prayer and intercessory prayer. We'll do a little review and then I'd like to pick up on a few things that we weren't able to discuss last Wednesday. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Lord, help us tonight as we look into your word. We pray that you will uh, help us with, with, uh, with regard to our prayer life. And uh, we, we ask, Lord, that uh, you would help us to be more mindful about prayer I pray that you will help us, Lord, to, uh, to get beyond just the whole rote uh, matter of it, the carrying out of it as some kind of religious duty. And may we realize, Lord, how we should be praying, for what we should be praying. And Lord, may we also pray with a realization uh, of whom we address in this. And we pray that you'll help us now tonight. I pray, forgive us, Lord, of sin, cleanse us, help us, Lord, to be filled with the Spirit. May your word work in us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so we uh, talked last week about how that the Apostle Paul had such a burden for these Colossian believers that he, that he prayed faithfully for them. Uh, and uh, he was a man of prayer. He, he requested prayer. Paul said, brethren, pray for us. Uh, now, I think you'd have to, I think in studying the Bible, you'd have to admit that the Apostle Paul uh, was not a man that was just uh, uh, interested in uh, religious duty. He was a man with a heart for God, a heart for the Lord Jesus Christ, a thorough belief in the, in the characters, uh, characteristics of the God of the Bible. He had a burden to win people to Jesus Christ. In my personal reading, I've been going through the book of Acts, and, and especially toward the end, how that God, uh, even when Paul was under Roman guard, uh, and on his way to Rome to be brought before Caesar, yet because of his walk with God, as you read through there, you begin to find out that in many cases, Paul was in charge, not his captors. And that was because of the hand of God on the man's life. Uh, and he had an, isn't that something? He had an influence on unbelievers because of the presence of God on his life. It wasn't like he was trying to boss them around. It wasn't like he was trying to be in charge, but because of the calm confidence that he had because of the presence of God, uh, he was able to have an influence on uh, those people. And so he was a man of prayer. He meant business. And he, that's what I'm driving at. The Apostle Paul meant business. And so when he said, brethren, pray for us, that would mean that he knew that prayer is what helps get the business done. And we've mentioned to you before that uh, that I think we, I don't even think in our heart and mind sometimes we've begun to even scratch the beginning of, a, of the awareness of the power uh, and the blessing that can come upon a people who learn to biblically pray. 
And, and so Paul uh, is, a, is a good example for us to learn from as he talks about his prayer list for these Colossian believers. Uh, and one of the things that we find, one of the things that we mentioned, I should say by way of review, is that Paul's prayer for them was instant. He said in verse 9, uh, For this cause we also, since the day we heard, of it, heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Immediately Paul began to pray for these believers. And we talked about the importance of doing that, especially for folks who are newly born again and how they need the power and blessing of God on their life. I, rem I remember... Uh, as a new believer, man, I was, uh, I was pretty confused about what was going on. Uh, I mean, I knew I had new life. Brother, I knew that the moment I stood up from the altar, amen, after having received Christ as Savior. But I didn't know what was next. I had no clue uh, about what uh, the, the, the difficulties of the Christian life or what direction I should go. And thank the Lord for believers that came alongside and helped and prayed for, amen. Uh, and they helped us along the way. Uh, that's, uh, that was the burden Paul had for these Colossian believers. Uh, and so he prayed instantly for them. But then we also noted last week that he prayed persistently for them. In verse number 9 when he said, we do not cease to pray. We do not cease to pray. I wonder, have you ever had anything on your prayer list that at the second it came to your mind, you thought to yourself, buddy, i got to have this. i got to know whether it's wisdom or some material provision. I have got to get, i got to get a hold of God on this. And it stayed on your prayer list about two days. And then some other thing cropped up. And next thing you know, maybe that first thing didn't have the priority that the next thing did. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that, that's, that marks our prayer life. Uh, a, a lack of persistence sometimes. Just to hold on to God. And we talked about how that Paul prayed unceasingly for these believers. And we talked about how that's going to require an attitude of God consciousness. Uh, God, the, the privilege of prayer is something that God gives us that we can do anytime, anywhere. And as you look at the, as you look at the Bible, especially uh, even with the Apostle Paul in the early days of his ministry and Peter, I mean, they were in prison. Uh, they, you know, they would go down to the synagogue, yes, and they'd preach, and they'd gather together and worship and pray. But in prison, he prayed. Uh, and every place in the world, you can pray. At any time in the world, you can pray. And that's a privilege that we ought to appreciate because it, what it means is that any moment, any time, I can get a hold of God. It's not just a, say a few words to make myself feel better. No, no, I get a chance to get in touch with God. And so, but it requires us to think about God all the time. And then it causes us to think about people all the time. People all the time. We have to have a God consciousness and we have to have a people consciousness. We've got to think about the needs of folks. Uh, and uh, it's, good for us to, it's good for us to have that prayer list where we pray for people uh, and keep them before the Lord. And there's specific needs that we talked about. Uh, uh, so his prayer was uh, instant. His prayer was persistent. Uh, and then we said his prayer was insistent in verse number 9. Uh, when he said here, uh, and to desire, uh, in verse 9. And we talked about how that word desire means that Paul had specific things that he wanted to see God do in the lives of these believers. He prayed specifically for needs. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, he, we have to be aware, of course, of those needs, as I said, and aware of the people of those needs. Uh, but since the day he heard their conversion, he prayed specifically for them. And this is where we kind of uh, came, uh, came in for a landing a little bit. He had several things on his prayer list for them. Number one is that they might know the will of God. Maybe you remember that. We talked about the importance of knowing God's will. He says there in verse number nine that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. And we said the most important thing that anybody can know after that they're saved is the will of God for their life. And that would include everything. That includes everything. That includes the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, specific things as is revealed from the Bible. In other words, to get saved, and it's God's will to get baptized. And it's God's will I become part of a church. And it's God's will I read my Bible. And it's God's will I pray. And it's God's will I give. And it's God's will I be a witness. See, all these things are revealed in the Word of God. They are part of God's will. But then as we talked about on Sunday, as we begin to do those things, God leads us into His perfect will after the manner of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, and so we need to know what God wants us to do, and we need to know how God wants us to do it. The most important thing we can determine in this life is God's will. That's true about who you marry. Amen. Amen. That, that's, that's true about what kind of job you get. You need to know God's will. Uh, and 
And so uh, he prayed for them that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And we said specifically that that's going to require dedication. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. That's going to require participation, which means I need to be doing what God has revealed in his word if I'm going to expect God to reveal to me his specific will for my life. And we quoted to you Acts chapter number 13, the first two verses. They fat, while they were fasting and praying, the Lord said, Separate unto me. The Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. They were already ministering. They were working. They were busy about the things that they knew they were supposed to be doing. And God then called them out of that assembly and sent them out to preach. Uh, and so it requires participation. I think I've given you this illustration before, but uh, years ago, a truck driver friend told me, you know, uh, he talked about the, these big rig trucks, and he said, you could always, when he, when he was driving on the road, uh, over the road, he said, you could always tell the guys that, uh, that had power steering in the trucks and the ones that didn't. He said, the guys that didn't have power steering in them, man, they had big old arms and forearms from cranking that big wheel. He said, but you know, the thing about it is, once you get the truck rolling, it's not that hard to steer it. And so it's a good illustration of how that God wants us to be serving him so that he can direct us in our life. Uh, and so uh, there, that requires, again, then uh, um, uh, it requires participation. But then also it requires discrimination, we said in the last part of verse 9, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. God's will isn't determined by, f by the flesh. We need spiritual understanding to, get, to understand God's will. Because our flesh will always do what we want to do. Uh, our flesh will always want what's best for us, not necessarily what's best for God. And so he says here, I want you to be uh, filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Uh, and we get this, of course, from the Spirit of God and from the Word of God. And, and so God's will is important. God's will is knowable. And he wanted them to know God's will and to be controlled by God's will, that you might be uh, filled, uh, let's see, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. And we tie that in with Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the point of that verse is that our, we're not to let ourselves be, be under the control uh, of, uh, of the influence of some of booze or drugs or anything like that. Uh, the, the, the thing is, we want to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Uh, when you're drunk, you're controlled by the booze, all right? Uh, uh, but when, as Christians, we, we don't want to be filled with that. We want to be filled with the Spirit of God and controlled by His Spirit. And so here when he says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will, we made this emphasis, and, and that is this. Our lives should be controlled by what we know is the will of God for us. And we don't step outside of that. Now, sometimes there, sometimes there's some uh, testing of the waters. Like when Paul wanted to go to Bithynia and preach, and the Bible says the Spirit suffered him not. Uh, he had a burden. To, was it God's will to preach the gospel? Absolutely. Was, was God desirous that people be saved? Absolutely. But it didn't mean that God wanted Paul in Bithynia at that time. Uh, uh, but um, uh, what, what, So while there is sometimes some testing of the waters for the will of God... We need to come to the place where God's will for our life is what controls our decisions in life. What we get involved in and what we don't get involved in. What we focus on, what we refuse to focus on. All these things. And so what does that mean? Again, it comes right back to this question. Do I know what God's will is for me? Do I know? Do I know that God wants me in the job I'm in? Do I know that God wants me in the ministry I'm in? Uh, and uh, do I, am I absolutely sure, for the, sake of our, uh, for the sake of our young adults in here tonight, am I absolutely sure that this, this person is the one God wants me to marry? And if there is no peace uh, in that, then uh, the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And unless you have the full peace of God that this is absolutely the will of God for you, you better not take another step. Let the will of God be your perfect guide. That's what he wanted for them. Why? Because once we are all in the will of God, now we're moving forward for Jesus Christ. We're all in our place and the Spirit of God's pleased and he blesses our family and he blesses our work and he blesses our ministry and souls are saved and the church is strengthened. Amen. Amen. All right? So... 
uh, Paul wanted them to be, we're talking about his prayer list, when he wanted them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Why? That leads us to our second prayer list, a, a prayer item on the list, and that is that he wanted them to walk worthy of the Lord. Look at verse 10. Now, I know we touched on this last week, but he said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. There's no way in the world you are going to please the Lord outside of his will. Look, so long as you're trying to hold and reserve some things for yourself, then there's no way that you're going to be able to please God. There has to be an absolute surrender after what we preached about on Sunday, after the manner of which we preached on Sunday morning. Uh, and so we need to walk worthy of, that's such a powerful phrase. Walk worthy of the Lord. Verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. I wonder how much of our life is not worthy of him and his name uh, and his attachment with. Uh, wow. That word walk there is a reference to the pattern of our daily life. Another word in the Bible for it is conversation. God wants our daily, every moment of every day of our life, we ought to strive to walk worthy of the name Christian. See, the Bible, uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12 that you would walk worthy of God. Philippians 1 and verse 27, only let your conversation, there's that word, your lifestyle, your manner of life, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel. Wow. What, what, what does that mean? That means basically that, that, that you know, we talked about uh, recently, Peter tells us uh, uh, that we're to be holy in all manner of conversation when we preached on holiness. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, what that means for us is that every aspect of our Christian life should be indicative of the fact that we have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, after the manner of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Is your life, look, is your life representative of the fact that you have believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Your whole conversation. We want to walk worthy. Now, how do we do that? Uh, how can I walk worthy of the Lord? First of all, by continually pleasing him, in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You can only walk worthy of the Lord when his pleasure is your first priority. Anything less than that is not worthy of him. It is not pleasing to him. Uh, we shouldn't spend our lives trying to please ourselves. Romans 15 and 2 says, let every, one of us please, uh, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification, for even Christ pleased not himself. Jesus didn't come in this world to live for himself. Uh, he came to live for others. He came to minister to others. He came to seek and to save, of course, that which uh, uh, was lost. And so we don't spend our lives trying to please ourselves, and, uh, and we shouldn't spend our lives. But isn't that what America does? Everybody's trying to just please themselves. Mind me, that, and, and, and some Christians even do, knowing what the Bible said, uh, that every man did that which is right in his own eyes. That's where that chaos comes from when everybody's living for themselves. Uh, and so we, we shouldn't be doing that. And uh, we should not spend our lives in bondage trying to please man. You'll never pull that off. Well, you might make a few happy, but you'll not get all of them. Uh, and... Uh, and that's okay. The Bible says it doesn't have to be. Uh, matter of fact, <clears throat> look real quick. We're in Colossians. So let's go to chapter number 3 and verse 22. Colossians 3 and verse 22. And the Bible says, Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now catch that phrase. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Why? Verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, he tells us here that uh, we're not to live our life in bondage trying to please men. 
And he tells us we're to do everything we do as unto the Lord. But there are many that use this verse in an effort to excuse themselves from their responsibility to human authority. You got to be careful here. Here's what basically the idea is. Look, I don't serve anybody. I just serve Jesus. So here's your authority and here's you. And the attempt is to say, well, no, I work for God, so I'm going to slip out here. I don't worry about my authority. It's just me and God. But the very first part of the first verse tells us, servants, obey your masters in all things. Matter of fact, you cannot serve heartily as unto the Lord unless you have a proper respect for the authority that God's put in your life. You cannot circumvent that and say that you and Jesus, just me and Jesus against the world, amen? That sounds good, but it ain't right. It ain't Bible. We have a responsibility uh, to that authority in our life. Uh, and so we, uh, we should ultimately spend our lives in pleasing the Lord. I should be controlled by the desire to obey God in all things, to please Him like Jesus said. I do always those things that please Him which would include a proper respect for human authority that the Lord has put into my life. Uh, but uh, when it comes to this matter of, of, of the right attitude with which I serve, God's not going to make me. Uh, I'm to be constrained by love to seek to please Jesus Christ. If I, Jesus said it this way, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, how, uh, d d does my lifestyle, does my conversation demonstrate that I love the Lord Jesus Christ? I I if we'd spend as much time trying to please the Lord as we do pleasing ourselves, we'd end up being a lot better off with God and others as well. Everything we do, we do with God in mind. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies be at peace with him. Uh, and so we got to think about, hey, uh, I, 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 I walk worthy of the Lord by continually pleasing the Lord, but then I walk worthy of the Lord by, by continually being fruitful. Look at verse 10 again. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. Being fruitful. It is God's will that we produce fruit for Him. In John chapter number 15 and verse 1, he said, I am the true vine, my father is the husband, and every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's that shelf of uselessness, see. God expects us to be producing fruit for him. Now, how do I do that? I produce fruit in a couple ways. One is by my witness. Now look, God wants me to be busy about doing the same thing he did, and that is uh, to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, and so I need to be a faithful witness that will produce fruit, the fruit of my witness. Every one of us should say, dear God, please help me. As shy as I am, as stubborn as I am, uh, sometimes, Lord, as, uh, as backslidden as I get in my heart and mind, dear God, help me to remember that souls are more important than myself. Well, I can't witness to somebody. I'm not right with God. Hey, the power is not in your rightness. It's in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, the Bible says. And so go ahead and tell them about the Lord and then go home and mourn over how you wasn't doing it when you told them about it. <laughs> but you, we've got to be faithful in our witness if we're going to see fruit for the Lord. But then the second aspect of that is not only witnessing for the Lord, but walking in the Spirit. And that's the key. Uh, Galatians chapter number 5, if you'll look there with me, please. Galatians chapter number 5 and verse 22. Galatians 5 and 22. <clears throat> and the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 22. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, that's charity, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Oh, Lord, I just can't bear up under it. You just can't. The power of the Spirit. All right? And then gentleness. <laughs> That's in the Bible, even for independent Baptists. And we're not, we're not to go around just be cantankerous all the time. I get as aggravated as you do. 
uh, and, uh, uh, and how the world's going sometimes. But the Bible uses the word gentleness. doesn't say smart aleck. Hello? Uh -uh. It says gentleness. In gentleness and goodness and faith. Verse 23 says meekness. That's power and control. We'll say more about that in a moment. Temperance, that's self-control. Against such there is no law. And so uh, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is what produces the fruit of our witness. And so, but the Bible's clear that we need to be uh, producing fruit for Him. I mean, I mean, it's connected right here. Walk uh, back, back in our text in Colossians 1 and 10. Uh, he says, uh, being fruitful. Uh, wait a minute, let me go back. That you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. Uh, it's just not honoring the Lord when our lives are fruitless. It's just not. And so we need to ask ourselves, dear God, uh, what, how, how do I need to come in line? If I'm not producing fruit for God, there's three possible reasons. One, I'm not saved. There's a lot of people doing God's work that ain't born again. Right, now, God will bless the gospel. We just said that a moment ago. Uh, but, an in, uh, but an individual, uh, by the way, that's because of the power of the Spirit is upon the message of the gospel. And the power of the Word of God is the same whether it's declared by a lost man or a saved man. It's the Word of God that's the power, not the person. But a person's life can't be blessed fully of God until they're born again. They can experience God good, God's goodness. He makes the rain to shine on the just and on the unjust. He makes the rain to shine. Rain to fall. Makes the sun to shine. Uh, Y'all just now caught it too, so there you go. Uh, on, the, on the just and on the unjust, right? Every person on the face of the planet experiences in some way God's goodness. Amen. By his blessing and provision for them. But Jesus still said you must be born again. And so wasn't, wasn't that what he said um, when Nicodemus came to him by night? And what did the Lord tell him? You need to get saved. Yeah, he was a Pharisee. Religious as the day is long. Faithful. Probably knew more scriptures than we'll ever know. As a lost man. And Jesus said, you need to be born again. Uh, and so thank the Lord that he was. But anyway, there's a lack of salvation. There's a lack of faithfulness. There's a reason why some people don't see any fruit. Uh, look at the phrase again in verse number 10. Being fruitful, what does it say? In every good work in every good that means we've got to be working there are some people that are waiting for god to drop spiritual fruit from heaven right on their head while they sit on their bottom that is not how it happens what does the bible say you got to sow to reap amen you got to plow you got to man you got to go to work right and so same thing with the lord i may not be seeing fruit because i'm just not faithful i'm not faithful i, I I'm, I'm not seeing fruit in my in my bible understanding because i'm not reading my bible faithful like i should I'm listening to the preaching. Are you reading your Bible? Uh, I, I'm not seeing the fruit of my prayer life because I'm not praying like I should. I'm not seeing the fruit of my witness because I'm not witnessing faithfully. You, you, you get it. You get it. And right on down we go. So um, uh, the idea of being faithful. Some people have no fruit because they're just not faithful. They dabble here a little and then they go somewhere else and dabble there. And the next thing you know, uh, it all comes up to naught. But then there's also the importance of the lack of spiritual growth. We don't produce fruit if we don't grow in the Lord. And so he goes on here to say in verse number 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, watch, and increasing in the knowledge of God. In the knowledge of God. Now, maybe you'll remember last week when we touched on this verse, we said that this, this, this knowledge it's, it is much more than factual. It is personal. Look, it is okay for us to believe and to hope for an experiential knowledge of God. That, that scares some people. Well, I'm asking, is God a person? Yes. And we believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all persons. Which means there's personal interaction with them. You see? Which means we will have... A, 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 a experiential knowledge of God. In other words, I, I, I wrestle with God in prayer and I see Him answer prayer. I serve Him and am faithful and I watch Him bless what I'm doing. There is that personal interaction. 
It's not just knowing all the data. It's walking with a living God. Uh, and so as we do that, we should be growing in our knowledge of Him. Here's how to test the whole experiential thing, because there are people having experiences that are whacked out. <laughs> Here it is. If my experience doesn't line up with the Bible, it's not of the Lord. That's it. Right? And so, uh, but I do have experience with it. Tell me your heart hadn't been moved in prayer and you knew God was right there with you. That's an experiential knowledge of God's presence. Amen. Uh, uh, and I think we've, uh, the, the lack of an understanding of that makes people more religious than relational. I'm glad I've got a God that wants to talk to me and wants me to talk to Him. And so, as I walk with Him and serve Him, I should be growing. All right? So He says that in verse 10, that there should be this increasing uh, in the knowledge of God. Now, immediately that puts us in mind of 2 Peter. So let's go there. 2 Peter and chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number... Uh, wow, the whole first part of it's a, a one sentence. He's talking about salvation. And so let's go to verse 4, 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Amen. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. As you know, there's something divine in you. Hallelujah unto God. I mean, that's a whole lot better, a whole lot better uh, than something defiled in me. Amen. <laughs> to have something divine in me. Partakers of the divine nature by salvation. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's your salvation right there. Now watch what he says in verse 5. And beside this, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Now notice that phrase there in verse 5. And beside this. Beside what? Beside what he just talked about in verse 4. There is more to our Christian life than just salvation. And here's where people struggle a lot because they say, well, I've trusted Christ my Savior. That's all there is till the rapture happens. No, 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 no. There's much more than that. He tells us. He tells us here. There is more to our Christian life than just salvation. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 5 and verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And he goes on down through there, talking about the importance of Christian growth. And then he says in, in Hebrews 6 and 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, leaving them, does that mean we're to deny Christ for who he is? No, no. He says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And that word means maturity. So we, what, the whole point of Hebrews 6 is this. You ought to settle your relationship with Jesus Christ as the foundation and then grow from there. A lot of people, man, though, they're not much interested in real spiritual growth. As long as I'm saved, that's all I need. No, no, no. Nope, not if you're going to enjoy life the way God said enjoy it. And according to 2 Peter 3 and 18, the Bible says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we do that? Well, it demands diligence. Uh, look at this here uh, in verse 5. Uh, and beside this, giving all diligence add. It takes commitment to grow. It takes effort. Remember I said before, if we're going to know God's will, we have to be uh, discriminatory about things in our life. We've got, to, we've got to put aside that which is unhelpful and focus on that which is. It takes effort. We're so easily distracted. 
We are naturally spiritually lazy. Remember I told you about the study that said now the human attention span is about like a goldfish? About eight seconds, about all a goldfish can hold on. And then it's going somewhere else. That's human nature. And our society doesn't help us any. <laughs> That's why I'm for a balance of, of this stuff here. Because if you carry it too far, it becomes like the thing that lures the goldfish away. It's distracting. And so now when you have churches, when the whole back wall is a moving video screen, I just wonder if we're able to focus on God like that. So we are so easily distracted. We are so spiritually lazy that the Bible's clear here. It takes diligence. A lazy, careless Christian does not grow. And what I mean, lazy in prayer, lazy in church attendance, lazy in Bible study, lazy in service, lazy in commitment to learning new things. When's the last time you tried to memorize a new verse? When's the last time you tried to take on a new truth? Huh? That's how you grow. Now watch. Uh, matter of fact, he goes right through that here when he says uh, in uh, verse number verse number five. Add to your faith virtue. That means excellence or praise. In other words, Philippians 1 and 10 says that we should approve things that are excellent. Philippians 4 and 8 says we're to think on anything that, of, of which there is any virtue. Here's what I'm trying to say. Christians should have a, a, a higher purpose for their life than just living according to the baseness of the world. We are to think about and add to our life the excellent things of God. We're to live a life above the world, the flesh, and the devil. The word virtue carries the idea of superiority. Not that we are superior, but it's talking about the superiority and the excellence of God. We need to add that kind of virtue to our life. And what is it? He tells us to add it. It's a command. Well, how do I add it? Read the Bible. I pray. I yield to God. I, I let His Spirit and His Word teach me how to live, that, to renew my mind, Romans 12 and 2. See, then he says we're not only to add virtue. Uh, by the way, uh, it, it carries that, that idea of excellence, and so we understand maybe a little better Colossians 3 and verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above and not... Uh, those things which uh, uh, are upon the earth. Uh, he says here, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What does that mean? Virtue takes us above the carnal, fleshly, shallow life. We need to add that virtue. Then he says, add knowledge in verse 5. Add to your virtue knowledge. And that refers to moral discernment. Boy, don't we need that in our day. I'm surprised, I think I said it recently, I'm surprised at how, uh, what, how much of a lack of discernment there is among professing believers. And most of it that I have experienced or heard in my life, experienced because not everybody, when you get born again, doesn't mean all of a sudden you're infused with all the knowledge of the wonder of God. Not at all. You got to learn and you got to grow. Uh, but experienced and seen in the lives of others is directly related to the lack of discernment is directly related to ignorance of the Word of God. Every time. Every time. I don't know enough of the Bible. I got plenty of time for all my shows, but I ain't got time for the Bible. I got plenty of time for all my hobbies, but I ain't got time for the Bible. And next thing you know, what happens? You don't have the discernment you need to make right decisions in your life. And so he says here, we grow by adding virtue, and to virtue this knowledge of the, uh, of the ability to discern between right and wrong, good and bad, false and true. And then he says in verse number 6, of course, that this knowledge will add to us temperance. That clearly is self-control. So, uh, I, I put it down this way. The more we grow in the Lord, the less we should be using the phrase, I couldn't help myself. Because I know what the Bible says. 
I know the Bible says what I'm supposed to do. I know what the Bible says I'm not supposed to do. Uh, and I have the Spirit of God within me to enable me to carry it out. One of the great things here about this verse where he says that, we, that he prayed for them to walk worthy of the Lord, one of the great truths of that is that it proves that we can walk worthy of the Lord. Some people have the idea they come into it with a defeated mind. Well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. There's no way in the world I'm going to be able to do that. No, no. God commanded you. God gave you his word and his spirit to help you. And you can walk worthy, Lord, if you'll choose it. So temperance is self-control. The more we know of the Bible, couldn't really means wouldn't. In other words, it's not that I couldn't help myself. I wouldn't help myself. I need to add temperance, self-control. Number four, I need to add patience, he says in verse six. Patience. This refers to endurance. It is the staying power of the Christian in times of trial. And the only way you have patience is by tribulation. Ain't that what the Bible says? Right. Only by tribulation. uh, Only tribulation works patience. So I have to go through it to gain strength. It's like lifting weights, you know. You, you wound them to, to build them. <laughs> hmm. And that's the way it is. Our strength should be growing all through our life. Growing to bear up under the trials and difficulties of life. And then he says to that we add godliness, which basically means a life devoted to God. You know, we sing the song, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Look here, that ought to be the testimony of every growing Christian. The more you, the, since the time that you've been saved, And all the time you've been living your life, you ought to have more of a devotion for God than you have ever had in your days, day by day. We're to add that. That's Christian growth. Uh, uh, And it's to, how long will we have to grow until we're done? The rapture. That's it. And all through life. We're to, be, we're to be adding godliness to our life. Brotherly kindness, he mentions in verse 7. That stands the reason. Be, be ye kindly affection one to another. Brotherly love and honor preferring one another. The more you grow in the Lord, the more you begin to realize that people are people. And they're not opposed to you in all their flaws. They're reflections of you in all their flaws. <laughs> That's right. They have the same quirks you have, same trouble, the same flesh they're wrestling with. And what that does is produce a burden for rather than an arrogant condemnation of the saints. Brotherly kindness. And, of course, he ties that all up here with adding charity, uh, which we remember from 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 being uh, the love of God. We, we grow beyond the phileo to the charity, the self-sacrificing love of God, where we give of ourselves like our Savior did for others. Now, let me mention this uh, with regard to uh, uh, one thing I want to mention, and we'll pray, is back here when he said uh, that we are to add uh, to our faith, uh, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience. If, if, if you were to kind of believe that every time something goes wrong, you throw a hissy fit, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. Patience is the ability to long suffer through problem, to endure difficulty. All right. Now watch. How do, I, how do I grow like that? How do I do that? Well, the study of God's Word, the service with obedience sacrificing every other unnecessary thing to pursue God. That's what Paul did. In Philippians 3 and 8, he said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything can go, but I must know Him. Now look, he's praying for these Colossian believers. Back to our text. Praying for these Colossian believers. 
and he's praying for them that they might increase, verse 10, in the knowledge of God. Now let me ask you something. Last time you prayed and asked God, God help me know you more. Was that list in your mind or were you just hoping for some divine zap and you got it? That's not the way God says we grow. He says giving all diligence add to your faith. You know why Christians don't grow like they should? Because they don't choose to grow like they should. They make bad choices. They choose themselves. They choose the flesh. They choose ease. They choose convenience. Uh, they, they, they choose, they like water. We're like water. We're tempted to follow the path of least resistance. And that's why we don't grow like we should. So when we think about our prayer life and Paul praying for these Colossian believers, I wonder, are we, grow, are we growing in our prayer life? Is our prayer life causing us to grow uh, in the manner that we've just discussed? I can't, th- I, I can't think of anything greater in this life than that God would be allowed by me to conform me to the image of his son. That's what, he's, that's what he's working to do. That's what he's working to do. And so when we pray, when we pray, God, I want to know you. When we pray, God, I want my children to know you. Uh, when we pray, God, I want the believers in my church to know you. This is what that means. To increase in the knowledge of God. Let's pray. Let's stand together and pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness.